Hi, this is Tim from Morial TV and Morial Radio here live. I'm actually in Jerusalem, Israel, and James Jacob Prash is in Belfast, Northern Ireland, and this is This Week in Prophecy. Greetings, dear friends, and blessings in Jesus. First of all, our apologies. We've been off schedule this week due to technical difficulties in Israel uh, with communication and Wi-Fi, but we are getting back on track with the Lord's help. Thank you for being so faithful, keeping us in your prayers, and continuing to watch our material online. But let's get down to this week in prophecy. We'll begin in Great Britain this week. It was announced this week in prophecy that for the last two weeks, a series of experiments that were underway as prototypical are now mainstay at, at Brunel University in the outskirts of London and Oxbridge. In the university supermarket, for the first time anywhere in human history, for the first time ever, people began purchasing groceries, not with a credit card, not with a debit card, not with a check, not with cash, not with coupons, not with food stamps. They began purchasing groceries with their right hand. An infrared device capable of reading the vein anatomy in someone's finger and digitally indexing it to their bank card is being used first as an experiment that is a prototype. Now it is essentially legal tender in this supermarket at Brunel University in the outskirts of London. Quite a thing, quite a thing indeed. Already in Great Britain, we have a situation where children in school cafeterias identify themselves to eat in the school cafeteria simply with a finger reading, simply with a finger reading. We see how the technologies are indeed evolving. Now, we're not saying this is the mark of the beast. We're simply saying the technologies are pointing in that direction increasingly, and there was a major advance in that direction this week in prophecy. We're also reminded that implantable variations of very chips that are bio-interactive with the central nervous system have been prototypically in use for over five years at Reading University in Great Britain, west of London. Um, there's actually people who are implanting these things. Now, anything that can be used for good will ultimately be used for evil. We can use these kinds of implantations in order to help people, perhaps with such diseases as motor neuron disease, or multiple sclerosis. Eventually, even there have been talks of light transmission by implantable microchips for people with dead optical nerves to help blind people to regain partial vision. And experiments have been taking place, again, in this area of nanotechnology for 10 years using organic microchips. But anything that man can use for evil, he will. Despite its capacity to be used for good, just like nuclear technology, what can be used for good will ultimately be used for evil. People actually purchasing food using their right hand as legal tender this week in prophecy. And it receives very little media attention. Very little. Shifting to the Middle East this week in prophecy. The Iraqi government, in league with Iranian-backed forces and with Iranian uh, Revolutionary Guards, have intensified their assault on Kurdistan and on Kurdish cities, causing the Kurdish provisional government to be willing to suspend the results of their election. They're getting such opposition from Turkey, from Iran, and now from the Iraqi government. The Western governments, including the United States, have been reluctant to be supportive of the Kurds, although the Kurds are the only people in the Middle East or in Iraq, certainly the only ones in Iraq, in the Middle East, who are non-Israelis, who we can firmly, firmly trust. Uh, yet, they're the ones who are being decimated. More of this shortly. It was announced this week in prophecy that West Germany is to provide, sell three new advanced submarines to Israel with the 
uh, the help of a $1.7 billion purchase that will be fully active by the year 2027. These will be capable of launching well-submerged intermediate-range ballistic missiles, capable of obviously taking out targets in Iran, Russia, and elsewhere. How this might play into a Gog and Magog scenario, we can only speculate, but it was announced this week in Prophecy that the three submarines are going to be acquired. These submarines will be of German manufacture, but undoubtedly they will be modified by the Israelis themselves, possibly with the help of the United States, which has the most advanced submarine technology. Let us continue. The American Secretary of the Treasury, Stephen Newsom, was in the Middle East this week in prophecy. And he was in negotiation with Israel and Arab states concerning the financing of counter-terror, of counter-terror. The dimensions of the war on terror and of containing Islamic terror are not simply strategic, they're also obviously political, but they are also financial. The costs of the war in terror have gone up astronomically. Unfortunately, the United States has yet to send the bill to the Saudi Arabians for backing al-Qaeda, causing the September 11th attacks. What the Trump administration has done, though, is conclude an astronomical arms deal with the Saudi Arabians, in which the United States are the primary beneficiaries in providing the armaments and the sales. This week in prophecy, the 100th anniversary of the Bellflower Declaration, Lord Bellflower, the conservative British Prime Minister, who was philo-Semitic and sympathetic to Israel in the aftermath of the First World War. Israel was initially promised a landmass that included much of the eastern Jordan. Ultimately, Israel only received 21% of what was promised by the British government and the League of Nations. Nonetheless, it's been 100 years since the Bellflower Declaration was passed and issued by the British government. Now, it had universal recognition by the League of Nations at that particular time. The notion being that the map of the Middle East was redrawn by the British and French in the aftermath of the First World War, as we pointed out before. Countries like Syria and Lebanon were French. Iraq was a country invented by the British, where the Sunnis, the Shias of the South, and the Kurds of the North were fused together into one artificial country. Jordan the same was a, and is a Palestinian Arab country with a Hashemite Bedouin government. All of these were created by the British and the French. Nobody complains about their existence. But somehow Israel becomes unique. Israel was created at the same time by the decree, in effect, although it did not formally become a nation until 1948 by an act of the UN. Yet we're left to understand something that there were negotiations in San Remo, Italy, that had international recognition. There was the League of Nations. There was later the United Nations, the British government, and a host of Arab governments all recognized Israel's existence. It was also recognized that there was a Palestinian state in Jordan. This was according to King Hussein of Jordan himself in 1970, according to Yasser Arafat in 1968. Again, according to the League of Nations, the United Nations, and the British government, the idea of a two-state solution is, again, nonsense. There already is a two-state solution. Nonetheless, the myth goes on, but it is the 100th year anniversary. Celebrations in Great Britain included Benjamin Netanyahu, arriving for a banquet that was celebratory and commemorative after watching a replay of the Anzus attack in Beersheba that swung the tide in favor of the British in the defeat of the Ottoman Turkish army, who were the allies of the Germans, the Kaiser, in the First World War. The Anzus attack by Australian and New Zealand cavalry 
was seen as a kind of payback for the disaster at Gallipoli. And it essentially opened the door for the British General Allenby to enter Jerusalem without firing much, as much as a shot. Some of the Arabs had never seen airplanes before, did not know what to make of them when British planes flew over the holy city. It was quite an event. These things climaxing with the Bellflower Declaration. Jeremy Corbyn, the British labor leader, refused to attend the banquet in support of Israel, being an anti-Israel figure. Jeremy Corbyn is very much the British equivalent of Barack Obama, except unlike Barack Obama, who said one thing and did another, who said he was pro-Israel, but acted directly against Israel consistently on the side of terrorist Iran, Mr. Corbyn is straight out about his disapproval of the state and nation of Israel. Meanwhile, this week in prophecy, the Kurds accuse Iran of having backed militias in an area known as Tuz, Tuz, who perpetrated genocide. This genocide was perpetrated by the Shia Hashad el Shi'abi in Tuz, uh, in an area called Kamatu. 160,000 Kurdish refugees have been driven from Kirkuk, 160,000, and the media says almost nothing about it. As we've been saying repeatedly, we are in danger of another disaster. When Barack Obama left the vacuum in northern Iraq, ISIS filled it. Now that the United States has demolished ISIS with its allies, the vacuum is being filled by Iran and Iranian-backed forces at the expense of the Kurds, and ultimately it will be to the detriment of the United States unless Iran becomes targeted. The problem here is this. The Barack Obama administration waged a intelligence war against Israel, leaking defense secrets that were both American and Israeli, including Israeli plans to use bases in Azerbaijan to attack nuclear targets in Iran, and also plans to send in paramilitary commando teams to liquidate Iranian nuclear scientists. The Obama administration made these things public, deliberately leaked the information to benefit Iran. Uh, Iran expressed their gratitude by taking the hundreds of millions of dollars on top of the 1.5 billion, the 400 million illegally. And then, of course, John Kerry publicly kneeling down as Secretary of State, licking the boots of the Iranians when American naval personnel were abducted by the Iranians in the Persian Gulf. There was no gratitude from the Iranians for the treason that the Obama administration essentially perpetrated, and it was a treasonous act. Nonetheless, this week in prophecy, the rooster is once again cocking in the morning. Something is definitely happening concerning the Kurds. The United States and the West are going to be put in a situation where they're either going to allow an Iranian takeover of northern Iraq or the United States is going to shift its policy in favor of the Kurds, together with the Israelis. Now, we would point out, Turkey is militantly opposed, militantly opposed to the Kurds because of the oppression of Kurds in the Kurdish areas inside of Turkey. Turkey is no friend of the United States. Approximately 80% of the people in Turkey are anti-American. It has a pro-Hamas government of Erdogan. And it is incensed about, again, the Gulen government in exile, as they would see it, based in the Pocono Mountains in Pennsylvania, committed to restoring Turkish democracy. A dangerous, dangerous situation. On one hand, the United States is in partnership and alliance with Turkey, but it's superficial. The actual actions of Turkey are not in any sense pro-American, certainly not pro-Israeli and vehemently anti-Kurd, and they are more than willing to act in concert, both with Russia and with 
Iran. Once more, is this a Gog and Magog scenario beginning to line up and take place? This week in prophecy, the U.S. House of Representatives <coughs> passed. I'm oh, sorry. This week in prophecy, the U.S. House of Representatives passed legislation concerning the activism of individuals and agencies involved in missile development in Iran. This includes those who are trading with the Revolutionary Guard Corps. The United States has asked the EU to designate Hezbollah as a full terrorist organization. At present, the EU only recognizes the military wing of Hezbollah as a terrorist organization. The actions of the American House of Representatives will target activists, individuals, agencies, companies who are trading with the Iranians in any manner related to their missile development. The United States is almost standing alone in support of Israel on this particular issue. Too many European interests, particularly German ones, are only there to see the short-term profit. Now notice, the Germans will sell defense apparatus like submarines to the Israelis in order to attack Iran, but they will sell technology to Iran. It's only about business. Inside Israel, this week in prophecy, the president of the Israeli Supreme Court, uh, Justice Miriam Nord, who is now retiring, issued a final decision allowing Israeli grocery shops called Makolot or Makolits to remain open on Saturday. The chair will now go to Eshet Hayat, but this has been quite a controversy. Can you sell groceries on Saturday? The Orthodox religious parties have been fighting to say no, but the Supreme Court in a final decision said it is absolutely legal to allow it. It is not unconstitutional or not a fundamental violation of Israeli law to allow this to happen. It is a case where the religious parties continually, as they always have since the foundation of the state, going back to Ben Gurion's alliance with the National Religious Party, to negotiate their relatively few seats in the Knesset, the Israeli parliament, for a disproportionate amount of influence and power. It's essentially political blackmail, holding the rest of the Israeli government and people hostage. Again, as we said multiple times, proportionate representation is the least democratic form of democracy. It takes the idea of a mandate from the majority of the people out of the equation and puts the decision making into the hands of political deal makers representing parties where small parties will have a disproportional amount of power and influence. We've seen this repeatedly in Germany, where the German government has had to pander to the Green Party in certain cases to keep them in government where people who are even at ideological odds against each other were forced to make such deals. Israel is plagued with this proportional system of representation. Again, it does not work. The political breakdown of it, however, has not infrequently found itself transformed from a political battle into a legal one. This decision does set something of a precedent and a setback for the ultra-Orthodox, attempting to force their views and their Torah observance on secular Israelis this week in prophecy. This week in prophecy also, the Iraqi Prime Minister has returned from talks in Tehran, Iran, with Khamenei. He's also had talks in Ankara, Turkey, with Tayyip Erdogan, Recep Tayyip Erdogan. Again, we are seeing a almost a reconfiguration of not strategic alliances yet, but certainly political ones between Turkey, the Iraqi government, and Iran. This does not go well for the United States. What did we fight for and what did we get out of it? Um, the compound disasters of the poor policies of the Bush administration, followed by the wholesale betrayal and, and, and vacuum created by Barack Obama, in addition to his pandering, 
in betraying American and Western interests and Israel's interests and the interests of the Gulf Arab states to the Iranians, we now have what amounts to a quagmire, a quagmire. If there is a realignment politically of Iraq, of Iran, and of Turkey, we need to fasten our seatbelts. It may begin politically, but ultimately it will become more economic and it will become finally strategic. Now, the economic aspect is already underway in that the war against the Kurds is being conducted and orchestrated by Turkey, by Iran, and by Iraq in concert with each other by economic strangulation. Denial of the movement of oil from oil rich areas of Kurdistan by pipeline and so forth as. Kurdistan is landlocked. The inability to move oil via pipelines into Turkey to Turkish coastal ports on the Mediterranean and so forth. This is what is happening. Also, the inability to move oil south by anything other than truck through southern and central Iraq to Gulf ports like Basra uh, is being blocked. And of course, the truck routes are easily blocked. There's already an economic constellation of interests of Iran, Iraq, and Turkey against the Kurds. So you have a political alliance forming, and you have economic cooperation forming for strategic reasons. How much longer might it be before these things take on a strategic role that brings into question Turkey's commitment to NATO? and places the United States in a precarious position. Once more, the Americans and the Israelis and some of the Gulf states will need to attack Iranian forces in Syria and in northern Iraq in league with the Kurds. This will have tremendous ramifications in relations with Turkey. We shall see what happens. This is truly a time bomb. Let us continue. This week in prophecy, the Saudi crown prince announced last week, Mohammed bin Salman, that a more moderate Islam that will be open to all religions and people will be implemented progressively in Saudi Arabia with an anti-extremism message. He also said that this modernization of Saudi Arabia which is sure to aggravate the Salafist clergy, at least the radical elements among them, uh, will be accompanied by a new economic policy. Saudi Arabia is trying to catch up to the example set by Dubai, looking to other areas of resource other than pure oil for financial revenue and economic development. He is speaking of building a mega city that will be basically a free trade zone of some description linking Saudi Arabia with Jordan and Egypt. Again, he's seeing economic modernization that is not so oil or petrol dependent at the same time where there is a modernization of Saudi Arabia, at least modernization or a moderatizing by Arab standards or by Islamic standards. Uh, again, the Salafist clergy have always been placated with money. The House of Saud paid them off to keep their mouth shut and to keep the peace and not to preach against the regime. But how far this will go for how long? Bearing in mind there have been members of the House of Saud who have been pro-Al-Qaeda, who have been, who are extreme proponents of exporting Sharia. But now the more moderates seem to have a hand. This explains the efforts of the Trump administration to broker secret negotiations between Saudi Arabia and Iran. One of the plans that had been initiated and was exposed by Barack Obama to the detriment of Israel were plans to allow the Israelis to have 
aerial operations over Saudi Arabia in route to and returning from attacking targets in Iran with the de facto cooperation of the Saudi Arabians. Strictly speaking, this would not set a precedent. Even going back to the time of the Carter administration, it is no secret that the American State Department, the Carter administration, the CIA, and the Pentagon, and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission all advised and assisted the Israelis in the attack on the Iraqi nuclear reactor all those years ago for fear Saddam Hussein would <coughs> achieve enough fissionable material to manufacture nuclear weapons. The Americans at that time secretly negotiated with the Saudi Arabians to keep AWAC planes from not operating in northern Saudi Arabia so the Israelis could fly over Saudi airspace to attack Iraq and return. This already happened. No matter what we see in terms of rhetoric, anti-Semitism, anti-Zionism, when it comes to their personal interest, the House of Saud is about one thing, and that is self-preservation. The House of Saud is essentially not only a family, but it's the government of Saudi Arabia that came to power by making a deal with the Salafists, that is the Wahhabist clergy. This week in prophecy, the announcement by the Saudi crowd prince is again, I wouldn't say earth shattering, but it is certainly groundbreaking. And once it is implemented, it will begin to become earth shattering if it indeed happens. While the Kurds offered to suspend their referendum and plead for a ceasefire, the Iranians have no interest in doing anything but marching on. The Saudis see this, as well as seeing their own quagmire in Yemen. They know things must change, strategically, economically, with the power of oil not being what it was, the Saudis are well aware that OPEC can never be what it was, that the United States has essentially developed a spigot or a faucet where oil prices go too high, fracking becomes economically viable. The United States can then drive the price of oil back down by opening the tap. Uh, they know that OPEC can never have the power it once had. They must look elsewhere. Hence, for strategic reasons and for economic reasons, they are being forced to face certain realities. But the statements that a moderate Islam that is open to all religions and peoples is almost unbelievable. It's something that would not have even been conceivable five, six, seven years ago. In the meantime, this week in prophecy, hypocrisy upon hypocrisy, Stockholm, Sweden, the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm, Swedish activist Akhmadriza Jajali began speaking of events in Evan prison in Iran and torture. That this torture is going on. We have what is self-proclaimed to be the first left-wing feminist government in Sweden an actual government that brands itself as a feminist government of women. Yet these same women, a delegation of senior officials from the Swedish government, when visiting Iran, wore the halabja. They kept themselves covered. They conformed to the demands of Sharia while claiming to be feminists. They pandered to the most ruthless form of suppression of women, known in the world, yet they claim to be feminists. We see the absolute hypocrisy. That which represents itself as being feminist is in fact anti-women. From Linda Sassor in the United States to the government of Sweden, the hypocrisy is unbelievable. Claiming to be feminist, they genuflect, bow down, to the suppression of women that takes place in radical Islamic countries and society, including Iran. We've seen another episode this week in Prophecy. This week in Prophecy, the aftermath of the Chinese Party Congress has come to full light. It is unquestionable now that Xi Jinping will be the most powerful leader in China since Mao Zedong. He will probably be more powerful than Zhou Enlai, 
he'll be more powerful than any other leader that China has experienced since. He finds himself in a difficult situation. We've warned before that the Chinese banking system has a parallel banking system called shadow banking that is a house of cards. It'll be a future disaster that at some point will eventually collapse. We've already seen what took place in the Chinese stock exchanges. We've already seen the declining productivity in China, rising unemployment, and the real estate bubble. But there is more to come. The government cannot continue to sustain, sustain itself this way without having a strong grip on political power. It is becoming more and more dictatorial. Normally, when economic affluence increases, governments tend to diversify, and the economic power translates into more political tolerance. In the Far East, this is not necessarily true. We've seen it did not happen initially in Singapore under Lee Kuan Yew and the People's Action Party because of the Confucianist philosophical influences in Asian culture, they can tolerate a patriarchal benevolent dictator more than the West can, when despite an increase in affluence, there would not be an increase in demand for political power. But that only works up to a point. In Tiananmen Square, that broke down. It's all been sequestered by the grip so far of the party bent on self-determination. At the same time, other economies and countries hostile to China, at least secretly, such as Vietnam and India, are becoming economic challenges to China. How long can it go on that they're pressing for a strong man? Once Lee Kuan Yew died in Singapore, his family, his children, began to publicly devour themselves. This would have been unthinkable when he was around. Will Singapore get another Lee Kuan Yew? Probably not. But will China get another Mao? It probably already has. Be careful of what's happening in China. Desperate people do desperate things. And if China begins to disintegrate economically, having political ramifications with things like the independence movement in Quebec, or Islamic uprisings in Western China, or simply urban discontent along the line of what happened with the Freedom Wall and the Tiananmen Square massacre, the party will do desperate things. It will have global ramifications for the rest of the world economically. A gross display of anti-Semitism in the world of Italian soccer, that is football, took place at Olympic Stadium in Roma, in Rome, the week before last. There were anti-Semitic and anti-Jewish depictions on the jerseys of the rival team, and it created something of an embarrassment for Italian football authorities. There are those in Italy demanding it be redressed, and that politics be left out of sport, but the politics has degenerated into something racial. Now notice what you see in the United States, where the refusing to stand for the national anthem has become a racial issue, an ethnic issue. The same is taking place in Europe. The same trends take place, the politicization and the racialization of sport. It may express itself differently in different countries, but it's the same underlying trend, be it the United States, with Mr. Kaepernick, etc., or be it in Italy. The point is this. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Nation against nation is ethnon against ethnon. It's not talking about political nations. That's the kingdom, the Basilea against Basilea. It is rather ethnic tensions increasing. Europe has a football culture a soccer culture that is very difficult for people in America to understand. It is basically a form of religion. In England, in Italy, it's a form of religion. It's their identity. They actually sing hymns in, 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 in some countries 
instead of going to church, they'll go to a soccer game and sing the hymn before the game. And they'll have anthems like, we'll never walk alone and things of this nature. This fervor is no more, more intense than it is in Italy. Quite the thing. Uh, but it takes on racial and nationalistic overtones. Again, the iron does not easily stick to the clay. In fact, they don't adhere, as Daniel tells us. Everything vindicates the truth of what Scripture warns us would be transpiring in Europe in the last days. They will try to make the iron stick to the clay, but it is not going to happen. As events in Iraq concerning the Kurds and the YPG, the Kurdish People's Protection Front, are opposed by Turkey, Iran, and by the Iraqi government. Rex Tillerson, the American Secretary of State, has visited the Ad Saudi Arabia and Baghdad with talks with the Iraqi government. At the same time, the Iraqis were talking to the Iranian government within a few days. The U.S. Air Force was back in new attacks against ISIS. But again, he said Iran should return to Iran. We see the first hints of a possible shift in American policy, a possible shift in American policy, where at least the Trump administration is beginning to recognize the threat of an, Israeli, an Iranian back takeover of more than Iran. We keep coming back to this issue, but now it is come into play in negotiations between America and Saudi Arabia. They quite are well aware of the danger of Iran. And the first hint or the first indication has been given in this negotiations and discussions between the American Secretary of State, the Saudi Arabians, and his visit to Baghdad. Well, let's continue. An attack has taken place at a Christian church in Bethlehem, St. Charles Church. It was very ugly, but the media said almost nothing, almost nothing. This compares to an attack on a church at the traditional site of the loaves and fishes in Galilee inside Israel. The Israeli government was up in arms. The prime minister, the Rosh Hashanah, and the president, the Nasi, publicly decried the attack on the church as an attack on all Israelis. It is not clear if it was Jewish militants, that is, radical Orthodox Jews who are anti-Christian, or if it was Muslims who perpetrated the attack, it remains under investigation. But the Israeli government at the most senior level stood up and spoke out and is pursuing police action concerning the terrorist attack as they would see this act of arson against a Christian holy site. But the Palestinian Authority utters not a word when the same thing happens in Bethlehem. Not a word. Either does the Sabia movement, either does Stephen Sizer, either does Salim Munyaner, either does Alex Awad, none of them. Christ in the Czech Post organizes none of them utter a word of protest. I recall when I was in Bethlehem and at Ramat Rahel, when Muslim terrorists took over the Church of the Nativity. Christian monks, or small c Christian, were hanging signs out in Armenian and English and in Hebrew, please get us out of here. Muslim terrorists were defiling the church. They were pilfering religious artifacts, and the Israelis surrounded the church trying to attempting to rescue the monks. CNN reported, as I was watching this take place on front of me, that the Israelis put the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, I'm sorry, the Church of the Nativity, the Israelis had the Church of the Nativity under siege. Since when does a rescue operation from Islamic terrorists become a siege? Well, only at CNN is such a thing possible. Again, what we see with the mainstream media, what we see with the political left, what we see with the Palestinian Authority, the Israeli government had absolutely nothing to do with the arson attack on a church in Galilee. They don't even know if it was a Jew or an Arab or Jews or Arabs or Muslims who did it. They don't know. 
But what we do know is the Israeli government forcibly denounced it and is investigating it and is looking for the perpetrators. The same thing happens in Bethlehem. Not a word from the Palestinian Authority. Almost no reporting whatsoever from the mainstream media and nothing from the so-called Christian lovers of peace, Stephen Sizer, Alex Awad, and company. Nothing from Salim Unioner. Nothing from Naim Atik. Nothing from this house of detestable hypocrites. Religious hypocrites of some of the lowest kind who've done nothing but pander to Islamic terror in the face of the persecution of Christians. This week in prophecy, Israel was again hit by a barrage of Syrian gunfire. One of the persons injured was an Israeli Jew, a Jew, an Israeli citizen who was a Jew on the Golan Heights. The Israelis have this week in prophecy publicly announced that although they had a non-involvement position with the internal struggles inside of Syria, they would defend a Jewish Jews village, Hader, on the Israeli-Syrian border. Although it is on the Syrian side of the border, it's immediately adjacent to Israel. They do this because of the high Jews population inside Israel, which are supportive of Israel and who have family living in that village. Israelis have attacked terrorist targets supporting Hezbollah in southern Lebanon in Syria. They have returned fire directed against Israelis from Syria. But now Israel has now Israel has adjusted its position, saying it will actually take sides inside the conflict in defense of the Druzy population. The village was hit by a suicide bomber from al-Nusra. Nine were killed and 23 were hurt. Again, many of these people had relatives who are Israeli Jews who live inside Israel. Thus, we see Israel being at least locally drawn into the conflict inside Syria in protection of the Jews' population. In the United States, this week in prophecy, we see the left-wing pro-Islamic spokesman for Palestinian Authority, an academic from Columbia University, Rashid Khalidi, giving a speech in New York at the Helge Tawil, uh, I'm sorry, at the, uh, giving a speech at the Hagop Kevorkian Center attended by approximately 85 people. Not a huge meeting, not a huge number, but he was speaking about the victimization of Palestinian Arabs by the Bellflower Declaration. It was hosted by Helge Tawil Suri, again, another so-called left-wing pro-Palestinian activist and feminist, but at the same time who says nothing about the human rights abuses of women in Islamic countries under Sharia. It is not only in Europe that this takes place. It is coming into America. It is time for America to begin taking away visas for any foreign academic that promotes radical expressions of Islam in any form or is an apologist for terror to any degree. Others have been arrested and deported for their involvement in terror plots, including the famous case in Florida. There are Israeli boycotts organized in universities around Europe, not allowing Israeli academics to visit as visiting professors to lecture. This academic ban of Israel has been extremely biased, and it is based on, again, a pandering to radical Islamic demands. But when you have actual radical Islamic professors and apologists for radical Islam in the United States, Nothing happens. These visas need to be removed. We should not allow people, foreign students or graduate students into the United States or into any Western country to propagate these things. Let us continue this week in prophecy. This week in prophecy, the New York attack. What has taken place in the south of France what has taken place in London. 
a Muslim lone wolf radical terrorist taking a vehicle and turning it into a weapon of terror, driving people over and killing them. This individual was allowed into the United States under a visa program of the Obama administration and Hillary Clinton. And of course, we have left-wing judges in the United States who say that by banning the entrance of such people whom we cannot vet, that we are violating their rights to come into the United States and kill American citizens or kill people in the United States who are visitors from abroad. Many of the victims were tourists from Argentina and other countries. Left-wing judges saying that you are violating the rights of terrorists by not allowing them to come into your country and kill you because you are singling out Muslims. This is crazy. They don't care about the rights of Americans. They don't care about the rights of their own citizens. They care about the rights of people trying to kill us. Now, no one is suggesting that all Muslims want to do that. But it is obvious there is no way under the present system to vet applicants looking to immigrate to the United States to see if they have radical backgrounds or not. Courtesy of Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama, a visa was given to the Boston bomber, to the other bomber who murdered the homosexuals in Orlando, to the San Bernardino couple, despite evidence on the internet that should have kept them out, but Barack Obama rolled out the red carpet for them. It is about time we realize the blood on the hands of Barack Obama, John Kerry, Hillary Clinton, and these judges who need to be impeached by Congress. They are violating the provisions of the Constitution. It is the president who determines immigration policy, and it is the Congress who makes laws. The courts cannot implement them. Even though the visa ban now includes countries such as Venezuela that are not Islamic, Another left, a left-wing judge who issued a previous decision says it is still anti-Islamic. It's discriminatory. If that judge was killed, or a member of his family was killed, in an act of poetic justice, the only way to describe it, not that I wish it on his family, he might be singing a different tune. What I'm saying is these judges are as guilty as the terrorists because they're enablers. We must have a sane immigration policy that can vet immigrants from Islamic countries. It does not exist at present. And until and unless it exists, the ban must come into place. There must be a cancellation of green cards. In many cases, there must be a revocation or at least a non-issuance of new student visas and a non-renewal of existing student visas. Finish your degree and go back where you came from until we have a way to vet. This person came in immigrating as a radical from Central Asia, as a fundamentalist Muslim who came here and killed Americans. What we also see is a radicalization process is taking place in America. America is catching up with Europe. By allowing these people in, they now are able to radicalize Muslims inside of America without needing to send them abroad or send them from abroad. Again, we've highlighted many times that as in the book of Judges, Islam is God's instrument of judgment against the backslidden Judeo-Christian world. In France this week in prophecy, it was revealed in of court trials of a Jewish woman uh, that involved extreme family violence that is a deadly mixture of anti-Semitism, Islamism, and family violence in the fundamentalist Muslim community in the Bandler around Paris. These things are mainstay. They are common. They take place all the time in France. But the Obama administration did everything they could to make them a mainstay and commonplace in the United States. 
and they are succeeding. This person never should have been allowed into the country. Yet he did. Who knows how many more there are. It also points to the record of failure of the politicized FBI. He was on their radar screen. He was known to them, as was the terrorist who killed the homosexuals in Orlando, as was the Boston bomber, suicide bomber for the Boston Marathon, as was Major Nadel at Fort Hood. They were all known to the FBI, and the FBI did nothing. The FBI has become too much of a political police force under the Obama administration and an ineffective national security agency. Again, we see Mr. Mueller, Mr. Comey. These are simply political bureaucrats. They're playing a political game. That is their priority. That is their function. This week in prophecy, we see not only evidence, but virtual admission of some degree of collusion between a corrupt Democratic Party and the Clinton administration involving the FBI and the Justice Department when Mueller was there. How can Mueller be allowed to continue as a special prosecutor when there's a conflict of interest when the FBI needs to be investigated by Congress in this regard concerning Russia? Again, this extends into the uranium deals. Will there be indictments? Why are these people allowed to get away with things? Why is Eric Holder not indicted? Why is Hillary Clinton not indicted? This week in prophecy, Donna Brazil, a woman who was publicly caught lying as the DNC chairman, admitted the Democratic Party is rigged. One does not need to be a political scientist to understand that their system of superdelegates means that it is not a Democratic Party. The Democratic Party establishment, through the use of superdelegates, can choose the candidate of their choice. It doesn't matter how the people vote in the primaries. It doesn't matter. But she has admitted that there was an effort that essentially was conspiratorial to assure that Following Donna Brazil's admissions, uh, proponents for the candidacy of <coughs> Bernie Sanders simply came out and stated publicly, we told you so, we knew this, now the Democratic National Committee is admitting what the Sanders supporters already knew. The obvious hypocrisy the self-righteous nonsense and the mainstream media not even dealing with this. We see the Democratic Party in very, very serious trouble. Unable to stop the Trump administration politically or electorally, they are trying to do it by legal means. But now the legal investigations reveal the Clinton's administration's, I'm sorry, reveal the Clintons and their foundation in their own involvement with Russia in pay for play. There's no end to this. It will go on and on and on. We need again to pray for the president that he does the right thing and for Mr. Pence. This week in prophecy, in a shocking, absurd move, the Europeans have awarded the father of a slain Palestinian terrorist. On Sunday, the Geneva-based International Institute for Human Rights and Peace and the Cain Memorial for Peace presented the Human Rights Award to the Palestinian Arab lawyer Mohammed Aliyan. He was honored for his legal representation three years ago of the wife of one of the terrorists involved in the synagogue massacre in Jerusalem. In the attack, terrorist Ghassan Abu Jamal and his three accomplices shot, stabbed, and beheaded four Jewish rabbis at worship before also gunning down one of the responding police officers. And you get a reward for doing this in Europe. I would remind them of Obadiah 15. 
of what they do to Israel in league and in sympathy with Israel's enemies will come back to haunt them, and the same will take place with them. We are told this clearly in the book of Obadiah, and it is always, always proved true. For the day of the Lord draws near on all the nations. So it's speaking of the last days coming closer. As you have done, it will be done to you. Your dealings will return on your own head. What was taking place is other nations were acting in support of the Babylonians against Israel. But the Babylonians then devoured those other nations. The same thing takes place in the last days, according to Obadiah 15. This week in the prophecy, former President Barack Obama, acting in support of the, the Democrat gubernatorial candidate, Ralph Northam, in Virginia, was bemoaning the way our politics just divided and became so angry and nasty. The man whose hypocrisy knows no limits. The man who deliberately left America a more racially and politically divided society than it has ever been at any time, probably since the Civil War or at least the period of Reconstruction. Quite a situation, quite a thing. This week in prophecy. We need to be very, very vigilant. The situation in Iraq is fluid with the Kurds. There is a real danger of the Iranians, with the tacit support of Russia, gaining a foothold in their ambitions to see a Shia caliphate instead of the ISIS Sunni caliphate extending from southern Lebanon with Hezbollah in alliance with the Assad regime, who is Alawite Muslim, a sect of Shia, through northern Iraq into Iran, an extension of Iranian power and increased Iranian influence and power in southern Iraq in the area around Basra. Rex Tillerson has already begun to acknowledge this and the ramifications of the series of betrayals of Israel and of the moderate Arab states to Iran by Barack Obama is now beginning to bear the poison fruit one expected it would, putting America and the West in a disadvantageous position, as well as inhibiting Israel from being able to as easily do anything about it as they otherwise could have been. Something has got to give. The Israelis are already returning fire inside Syria, but have now committed themselves to defending the Drew, Druze population in Syria. This can all blow up. It can recede or it can explode, but it can never be the same as it once was. There will not be a stability or a status quo again. Once more, we implore prayers for the American administration, Mr. Trump, Mr. Pence, for Mr. Netanyahu in Israel, and for any of those who are sincere in opposing radical Islam, including the Assisi government in Egypt. Something is going to happen. The question is what and when. Even if it recedes for a season, it will inevitably come back. Again, it is not something that requires a lot of imagination to see an interplay of forces from Iran, Turkey, and Russia coming into some kind of concert against Israel. It can happen, and it can happen quickly and easily. We are seeing it this week in prophecy. Jesus is coming soon. My name is Jacob Prash coming to you from Belfast. Tim Worth this week is in Jerusalem. God bless, Lord willing, see you next week.
Ah, ça tire. Ah, ça tire.